Okay, team, Coach Ray here. I'm a triathlon and marathon running coach. I'm down here at the finish line for the Buller Marathon, which is being held tomorrow, but by the time this is on the website, it'll be yesterday. Um, I'm gonna take you through an article here from Sue Hooper and Laurel McKinnon about monitoring overtraining in athletes. Now, marathon runners, yeah, I know you all overtrain. Um, yeah, I'm guilty as well. So, a uh, number of recommendations come out from this article in the Journal of Sports Medicine. Now, while attempting to maximize training benefits, athletes may become overtrained, frequently exhibiting signs and symptoms of overtraining syndrome, including chronic, high levels of fatigue, stagnancy, or deterioration in performance and mood changes. The downside of overtraining is the risk of injury, illness, and premature retirement is increased. Now, rest or greatly reduced training over several weeks or months may be needed for complete recovery. Now, some of the problems with um, classifying overtraining is the terminology involved. Now, overtraining may therefore be defined as high volume and or high intensity training with inadequate recovery, resulting in non-adaptation, requiring several weeks or months of rest or greatly reduced training for complete recovery. So the moral of the story is you do too much training, it hurts, you need to take time off training to get better, to recover, and to then start training again. So the crux of it is, um, another option being overreaching should be used to uh, describe training, which causes a few of the signs and symptoms of overtraining syndrome, but does produce short-term fatigue, uh, and performance decreasements from which an athlete recovers after a few days rest. So it's a key difference between overtraining and overreaching. Overreaching is easy and quick to recover from, whereas overtraining requires a longer period of time. Now in this article, they talked about a number of things that they can utilize, or you can utilize, to monitor your overtraining level and therefore get the benefits of recovering quicker from it and avoiding becoming overtraining. Now, some of the classical things um, that they looked at to see whether it is an effective um, monitor or tool to utilize um, was high serum creatine kinase. Well, what is that? Basically, it's an enzyme that's released out uh, of the muscles uh, when you do high intensity training. Um, but when you've got high serum or in the blood creatine kinase levels, it indicated alterations in muscle cell membrane permeability resulting from intense exercise were once considered a good marker of overtraining. This isn't the case anymore because creatine kinase has been shown to be significantly elevated in the absence of overtraining syndrome and within the normal range in athletes that do suffer from overtraining. Hence creatine kinase is no longer considered an appropriate marker of overtraining. Similarly, low erythrocyte counts or blood cells, um, so it says low erythrocyte counts, hemoglobin and serum ferritin levels have also been discarded as reliable markers since these have been shown to occur within the presence of overtraining syndrome to be similar of for overtrained and non-overtrained athletes and not to change significantly with overtraining. So those are no good as markers either. So these were things that back in the 90s were considered the go-to for determining whether things were, whether an athlete was overtraining or not. Proof nowadays, not the case. Uh, another common one is an increase in resting heart rate of five to 10 beats per minute above normal values has been suggested to be a marker of overtraining. However, before overtraining can be implicated, other possible causes of this, such as infection, emotional upset, insufficient or poor sleep, uh, need to be discounted. If you do have a resting heart rate that's elevated, those five to 10, particularly greater than 10, and it is an infection, you want to be recovering uh, to allow your body to heal. So whether it's overtraining or infection, you're still gonna cut back on your training. So I still utilize that. Uh, so the recommendations that they've come up with, uh, physiological tools. So the authors have been unable to confirm physiological markers of overtraining. Parameters which have been investigated previously include resting and or post-exercise heart rate. So that's what your heart rate is at the end of a workout and blood pressure as well. Uh, resting and exercise oxygen consumption, your volume of oxygen that you consume. 
uh, as well as blood levels of red and white cells, hemoglobin, iron, ferritin, glucose, urea, and various enzymes and hormones. You don't have the ability at home to monitor those levels, so we'll move on from that. However, um, report occurring overtraining in some of the studies, but not others. Some investigators have accounted for the apparent contradictory effects by splitting overtraining disorder into two types. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic overtraining syndrome. Now, to cut through all the, the scientific waffle waffle, sympathetic is basically uh, part of your neurological response. It's your fight or flight, where you go do something quickly uh, and fight or you run away. The parasympathetic, that's um, how your body regulates things unconsciously. Um, so it's your breathing, your eating, well not so much the eating, but the digesting of the food, absorbing that into the body. So in contrast to the fight or flight, that's known as rest or digest. Um, so where do I get to? In sympathetic overtraining syndrome, the predominance of sympathetic activity is suggested with increased resting heart rate and increased blood pressure, decreased appetite, and loss of body mass, disturbed sleep and irritability. With parasympathetic overtraining syndrome, it's suggested that um, to reflect the predominance of parasympathetic activities, characterized by low resting heart rate and blood pressure, long periods of sleep and or depression. So both these types show deterioration in performance and persistent fatigue. It is possible that the overtraining response follows a progression reflected by predominance of a sympathetic followed by parasympathetic simulation. So one typically follows the other. Alternatively, some other authors uh, differentiate in the types of stress imposed by different sports. For example, endurance uh, events versus shorter, more intense interval training may result in different physiological profiles. So sympathetic overtraining is suggested to affect mainly speed and power athletes, and parasympathetic overtraining mainly affects endurance athletes. However, in the literature, the symptoms of overtraining syndrome reported in endurance athletes tend to reflect sympathetic run parasympathetic overtraining. So the authors of this study um, discount that. Some of the psychological tools that are used are looking at the mood states of athletes, such as tension, anger, depression, vigor, fatigue, and confusion have been described as being useful for assessment of overtraining and to adjust training loads. Several studies have shown increased mood disturbances coinciding with increased training loads, and other work has indicated that self-reports of post-training fatigue may allow under-training to be monitored. Now the mood states, such as those me measured by the profile of mood states, or what's known as the POMs, have been used to successfully identify athletes showing signs of distress due to intense training or high volume. However, they have yet to be shown to be reliable for differentiating between overtraining and intensely trained but not overtrained athletes. Case studies clearly demonstrating overtraining syndrome have shown POMs, total mood disturbance or the TMD scores, to be higher than those of non-overtrained athletes. Furthermore, significantly higher TMD scores have been reported for three overtrained swimmers compared to 11 others undergoing the same training but not considered overtrained, and in five men who became overtrained after 10 days of intense interval training. So while the POMS is a promising monitoring tool, it is not yet clear whether it will predict overtraining in all athletes and whether it will be used uh, or whether it can be useful during competition phases. So the crux of that is that despite using it, saying, giving the indication that you might be overtrained, it might be giving a false positive, or conversely, it could be giving the opposite result, um, a saying that you are not overtrained when in fact you are. Um, there's also, they've also investigated a self-analysis tool, and they suggested that overtraining is most effectively monitored by athletes themselves using self-analysis tools. While no studies appear to have determined whether self-analysis by athletes accurately and reliably prevents overtraining, this type of tool may be an effective means to provide valuable information about an individual's response to training. One of the things I use with my athletes in either training tilt or training peaks is 
tracking and monitoring how their training goes, particularly the resting heart rate. So we can track that over time. So if we start seeing a peak regularly for their resting heart rate or their mood being depressed, we can look back and see what led to get to that point and how their training's going. The self-analysis tool, or one of the ones utilized, is the daily analysis of life demands for athletes. And it's a questionnaire devised as a means to avoid overtraining. This tool requires athletes to assess sources of stress in their life and rate symptoms of stress such as muscle soreness and irritability and incorporating that into a logbook. This tool has been used by Australian Olympic teams to enable coaches to monitor training responses. Uh, another tool, the Psycho Behavioural Overtraining Scale, has been used by British athletes in similar situations. So looking at this, in a number, oh, sorry, in a group of 14 swimmers, self ratings of fatigue, stress, sleep, and muscle soreness predicted overtraining six weeks before deterioration in performance occurred, or any other signs or symptoms became apparent. Therefore, it appears prudent for athletes to keep training or daily training logs, which includes measures such as um, ratings of well-being, of fatigue, stress, sleep, muscle soreness enjoyment of training, irritability, health, as well as other causes of stress and unhappiness in their life, uh, as well as incidences of injury, illness, and also menstruational um, cycles. These logs appear to provide a simple, ineffective, and time efficient tool for monitoring overtraining. However, use of such measures to identify athletes showing a tendency towards overtraining syndrome is very much dependent on interpretation by the reviewer, usually the coach or some form of high performance management staff member. So in summary, a monitoring program for overtraining may be considered part of an effective professional management of athletes during intensive training. The most appropriate tools for a program is still debatable. Comprehensive physiological testing has not been shown to be better than non-invasive and less costly psychological testing using the POMS or self-analysis using simple questionnaires or daily logs. The later two methods provide assessment results more quickly, but have the disadvantage of possible distortion of response by the athlete, i.e. the athlete wanting to train hard, so lies about how they're feeling so the coach doesn't cut their training back. At present, it appears that Conscientious self-analysis by the athlete is the most effective method of monitoring overtraining since long-term daily records can be kept with relative ease compared to the other methods. So in a nutshell, if you just track how you're feeling, some basic physiological measures such as your resting heart rate, the training that you complete and how you feel after that training, it's going to give a good insight into how overtraining develops and so you can cut back and manage your training or your coach can do that on your behalf to ensure that you get the best results out of your training. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. For more videos of this nature, click down below and keep an eye out for my Science on Sunday articles in the future.